Cool. Pleasure to meet you guys. Um, so yeah, I've uh, I fell in love with the saxophone just like you guys, and you know, uh, ever since it's been it's been a crazy road. Uh, I think one of the things that I that I noticed about it right away is that um, it's different than every other instrument I've ever seen, <laughs> every other wind instrument I've ever seen. Um, you know, the fact that it's brass and wood. There's like a little piece of wood making it a woodwind because <laughs> it's very crucial. You know, the vibration comes from here. Um, but another thing that really, really has fascinated me uh, over the years, it's, uh, it's also uh, been a frustration to me, is that it flares out. Uh, you get a clarinet, you look at the bore, it's cylindrical. So it's a cylinder, it goes straight down. So it's even sounding, you know, throughout all the ranges. It has an incredible range. Um, I think it's about three octaves, a little over, maybe. And then you have the saxophone, which is skinny here, medium here, and then huge over here. So you have three possible ways, or three different embouchures, <laughs> or three different airstreams uh, that you could approach it with but you don't want to because you want the sound to be even, you know? So it's, it's, you know, understanding the physics of the saxophone is probably one of the, uh, the you know, the greatest things that will, that will help you in your development. Um, I think the, the, the most friendly practice for us on saxophones is uh, probably the overtone series because every single note is coming out of the same exact hole, the bell, <laughs> you know, you close all, every single uh, note on your instrument and you play a series of mathematically um, calibrated overtones from the fundamental, which is B flat. They call it the fundamental because it's the lowest note on the horn. Uh, on some of the berries, you have a low A and that becomes the fun fundamental but that can throw a lot of things off. <laughs> a lot of berry players told me that. A low A compared to low B flat baritone, very different sound. But um, as long as we have an understanding that uh, when we're playing in like a, let's see, like a B up here, uh, compared to a B down here, that we should have the same air support as we do for the low B. As long as you have that kind of thing going on, uh, you're, you're on the right track <laughs> to having an even sound. So uh, I'll just demonstrate some of the exercises that I've developed um, uh, um, that are based on overtones. Uh, one of them... <laughs> with that same B flat. Then I try to match it to the fingered B flat up an octave, then I go up a half step. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, to visualize it if I just say it. Maybe I'll like write it down or something. Actually, I have some PDFs um, on my computer. I could send it to you guys' email if you give me your email or something. And I can show you the exercises because I wrote it down one day. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll play it again. exercise uh, a calibrated thing um, so you get a metronome. I love iPhones. They have everything we need in life. <laughs> <laughs> One 
<laughs> okay, let me take this to about 70. shouldn't move that much. I think the armature should be pretty stable. Um, but you're, you're, control, you're using all kind of uh, muscles to control the horn all at once. So it's a great exercise. Uh, it's good for long tones. I haven't done it in a long time. So as you, you see, my, my tone is kind of weak on some of the notes. But when, I'm, when I've been doing this for about a week straight, by the end of that week, all those notes sound pretty much the same, and that's the goal, is to make every single one of those notes sound like they're coming from the same person, with the same intent and the same <laughs> airstream. Uh, and when you do it with a metronome, it's great because you have the same length on each note. And uh, you know, it's a very, very great exercise. And uh, all the exercises that I do to uh, expand my technique on the saxophone. I like to do them with drones. You know, that's why you heard me earlier playing some drones because I just wanted to show you guys how much fun I have at home. You know, like, <laughs> I'm like in my practice room, just going crazy. You know, I was like, wow, man, I'm hearing another overtone now. Let me play with that one. Then. You know, but when you play your exercises with uh, an over with a, with a drone, a drone is basically a held out frequency. Um, it's basically an infinitely uh, held out frequency. It's infinite until you stop it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so when you play with along with drones, it's a very, it's a very good um, uh, indicator of what is going on with your airstream. You know, the drone is consistent. It's the same frequency. Um, it's in tune. <laughs> so. If you hear anything happening different, it's you. <laughs> you know right away, I'm doing something wrong. Or not even necessarily wrong, it's just something changed. You know, my airstream got weaker, so it got sharp. Or my airstream got too strong and it became flat. You know, there's all kinds of things like that that happen within the exercise. But if you do the exercise without the drones, it's like practicing bad, bad habits. No, but if you practice with the drone and with the metronome, you'll notice right away, oh, okay, when I get to that note, I'm a little sharp. Or oh, when I get to this note, uh, it's a little flat. Hmm, on this passage with the metronome, I'm noticing I'm dragging when I get to this part of the, the horn because it's weird fingerings. Let me try to correct that. So it's good to have, uh, to use technology to aid us in practicing because this is technology itself. That's what a lot of people don't understand. Like they're like, "Oh, why, why you have to use all these gadgets and everything?" This is a gadget. <laughs> this is a gadget. Music existed before this thing. There were frequencies. Um, there were notes. There are all kinds of things existing before. It. But um, an inventor named Adolf Sax invented this saxophone. It wasn't quite like this when he invented it, but he invented it to to harness those notes in a very calculated way. Um, the very first saxophones were very, very out of tune. And as we progress in uh, you know, technology and getting things you know, more exact, 
the saxophone becomes more and more in tune out of the back, out of the box. Um, and uh, you know, it's very important to to understand all these things so that we, when we play the instrument, we're not blaming the instrument or uh, or depending on handicaps to get around the instrument, you, you start to, you know, try to address the, the handicaps. You try, you try to address the, the problems that you're facing when playing the passage. So um, uh, let, me, let me start a drone here and play an exercise that I like to play. Oh, a lot of my exercises are based on triads. meaning it's it's within the key um, it doesn't go outside of the key that you're in so <laughs> to make um, it starts to to bring out some some weaknesses in your hearing you're not used to hearing those notes in a different octave than than usual you know you're used, so used to playing one three five but when you play um, it's harder to get that top note in tune which is the third. <laughs> so I'll just show what happens when you're not really paying attention and you're thinking, oh, it's a triad, it's, it's very easy. I'm not gonna pay attention. Finally, it got there. <laughs> so, naturally, when I first started. 
started this exercise. Oh, God, you said <laughs> when I started this exercise first, um, I was playing the top note sharp because um, I was thinking, oh, you know, it's an, it's the next octave, so I have to, you know, press on something. Nope. <laughs> Actually, the higher you get on the horn, you'll notice when playing with drones, the higher that you get in the range, the more you have to open your throat to get the notes in tune. You, when you, by the time you get into the altissimo, your throat looks like frog, like <laughs> big bullfrog. <laughs> but um, it's necessary in order to shape the notes so that they're in tune. Um, so I'm going to try to play this exercise. <laughs> Jensen was playing trumpet on the gig, and I heard her practicing to a drone. She had a drone machine. She had like a real drone machine, not like an online stream kind of thing. An actual drone, mach drone machine, and she was practicing to it every morning. And I was like, wow, that sounds incredible. And she would come to rehearsal like, wow, like so, so accurate, the notes and everything. Like so, like practicing the drones. She was like, "Yes." She was like, "Yes." Yeah. So somebody showed me, you know, that drones are, are very, very good to practice to um, for everything, for every single thing. We play a whole tune to a drone. You know, it doesn't even matter if you go out of key. You're just hearing the relativity of the notes that you're playing to to the fundamental. And um, I started doing that, and lo and behold, I started unveiling so many. Uh, intonation problems in the in the high register, especially. So I'm going to play some this same exercise with mostly altissimo notes to show you how much it can kick your butt. <laughs> <laughs> So I started playing 
to, to, you know, test out what's going on with your Airstream, your embouchure, um, no matter what register you're in. Because you want every register to sound pretty. You don't want one register to sound like a totally different person, like mad, angry, drunk, and then all of a sudden <laughs> you're going to sound like somebody who's gardening having a good time. <laughs> you want to sound like the same person, <laughs> or at least be able to sound like the same person, so that you're in control of the horn, you know, and you sound the same throughout all the, the, uh, the registers. Um, so, yeah, I, I really recommend it. Drums have changed my life. They've changed my playing. They've made me a better person. <laughs> and I want to share that with you, too. <laughs> um, so, uh, Another th thing I wanted to, to address is uh, uh, playing a cappella. I think it's a very important thing for horn players to be able to play a tune a cappella. Because if you can't play it by yourself, <laughs> and you're, and you're that means you're dependent on the rhythm section, or you're dependent on accompaniment to make the, the solo or a song exciting and you don't want to do that you want to be able to to be a, a provocative within an ensemble you want to be able to steer the ensemble it's like you know what nothing's happening i'm going to do this and everybody follows because you know it's like you you're taking charge and you're taking the reins and, and it also requires uh, a vast amount amount of knowledge of the song you can't really command the song if you can't play it by yourself. You know? So I'm going to play something a cappella just to show you um, some of the ways you can you can isolate yourself so that so that you really learn a tune. You know, I'm going to play something. Well, I'll play Countdown.
standing in front of these people and I want them to understand what I'm doing <laughs> and at the same time make it interesting and at the same time actually know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do, but the more you do it, the more comfortable you become uh, with playing songs by yourself, totally by yourself. Um, the more that you will become a very interesting player to play with, you know? You want, it's not just for the audience, it's not just for you, it's also for the musicians that you're playing with. You know, it's like, you gotta make it interesting for them. They're musicians too. They've heard all kinds of saxophones. They've heard all kinds of uh, musicians, all kinds of ways of playing the tune. So if, if you haven't been uh, trying to harness your own way of playing the tune, you know, it becomes a little boring. But we don't want anybody to be boring, we want it to be exciting. <clears throat> so you have to make sure that you can make it exciting by yourself. It's a very, very important thing to do. Uh, so I, I really, really suggest it. And, and another thing, it, it all comes down to using some very calculated instruments. The metronome, you get the metronome say, oh, when I get to this fastest, I always <laughs> slow down. Why do I do that? Keep it going. <laughs> make it, you know, make the rhythm very constant, make the tone very constant. Um, you know, these things really, really do kick our butts, but at the end of the day, um, we become stronger players. And, um, you know, so I, I really uh, suggest checking out players who are very good at doing this. Um, one of them, namely, Sonny Rollins. Sonny Rollins was always practicing by himself, on the bridge, under the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in the practice room, no, no matter where it was. And there's always some kind of like um, acapella solo break or something on his records. Because it, it shows that he's, he's a very independent player. He doesn't need anybody else <laughs> to make the music for him. He can't, he doesn't have to lean on anybody else. You know, he play tunes like. <laughs> Thank 
going to be right on beat. So, if you're not on beat with the metronome, you're wrong. It's like there's no, <laughs> no way around it, right? Um, it also keeps a steady beat so that you can try some different things against the steady beat. And the more you're used to having the steady beat around you, when you take it away, you can still be steady. <laughs> you're used to having something steady to, to compare to. So this is one of the things that I, I really, really want to, 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 to address um, with students is that um, you don't want to practice bad habits. You want to practice very good habits. So it's good to always have, yeah, have that rigid merit metronome, that rigid tuning drone, all that stuff going while you're practicing. It helps so much. Um, there's been countless times when uh, I've given, given some kind of clinic and I've talked about like some exercises and how important it is to have the metronome and, and the tuning drone. And I said, okay, who wants to take the challenge? Who wants to actually try this for like a, about a week? And, you know, maybe one brave soul would do it. And I would say, okay, cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you after a week and see what's going on. Um, some of them didn't actually do it, <laughs> and some of them actually did it, and all of the ones who actually did it, they were very, very, very pleased. They were like, wow, it's only been a week, and I'm already so much stronger. It's because they're holding themselves against the stronger standard. You know? What was it that you had them do? Oh, I would have them do exercises like the one I just showed with the triads, mm -hmm. um, but with a tuner um, and a metronome. You know, set the metronome at 60 BPM, play this exercise um, from the bottom to the top of your horn every day until you can, you, every day your goal is to play it uh, from, top, from the bottom to the top of your horn without having to take a break or correct something. So that means yeah, you're going to be there for a while, yeah. <laughs> getting that thing to sound good. But once you get it to sound good, then you stop. Then the next day, you do the same thing. Then the next, you do the same thing. And it's, it really doesn't take that much. It might take about 30 minutes to really get the thing solid, <laughs> you know? Then the rest of your day, you eat popcorn, go to movies, take your girlfriend out, whatever. <laughs> the next day, you, you do another 30 minutes. So. It's very important to to make the make your practice sessions really count, you know? Like really, you know, focus is something that's very hard to have for long periods of time. But if you have just one moment in time, very short moment in time where you're just focusing on this one thing, if I could just get this exercise to sound right with the metronome and the tuner, oh, that would be great. And then the next day you do the same thing, the next day you do the same thing, by the end of the week, you're going to be like, wow, I've changed my life in one week. What about a month? <laughs> you know, it's not really, it's really not that much. It's just a consistent practice. You know, that's the, that's the goal. Um, and
and you also want a consistent sound on this horn. If you if you see that when you get to a certain register, it sounds weak or it sounds um, a, it has a different color and timbre. You want to address that. You want to address it so that your airstream is more uh, consistent. You know, very important thing to do. Uh, but now that I've got past like this, it's very intense, you know, stuff that I'm talking about. But I, I want to open it up to questions, if anybody has any questions, you know. You sound like you have, you look like you have. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for that uh, exercise that you do, you go mm -hmm. one, five, ten, mm -hmm. correct? Um, and do you do different mixtures of that? Or um, what is, what is like a standard like practice session with that? Like oh, I, it's, um, I'll show, I'll show you it here. Cool. Here we go. Look at this line right here. So it's um right there he has it as triplets. So I noticed that I was dragging on some of it. So I have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't do that. <laughs> you know? Good enough for jazz. Yeah. <laughs> like you, you wanna you wanna be good enough for everybody, you know? That's what you want to do. <laughs> but um there's many, you know, these are just like I you know, when I go to A twos and um or make an exercise myself, um I also I also keep in mind that, you know, after a while, I'm going to get pretty bored. My neighbors are going to get, going to get pretty bored <laughs> of the exercise. <laughs> so, you, you know, you can use your creativity to just make it different, you know? Add something, you know? <laughs> like, okay, I'm playing the triad, right? So what if I add a seven in there? <laughs> you know? Let me see how that sounds. Let me see. What would that sound like? <laughs> yeah, so then you make an exercise based on fourths, you know, like four, four note patterns, you know. Yeah, you can, it's up to your imagination. You know, there's no set way to do the exercise. That's just like, it's like, Joe Allard's basically like, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? No, it's kicking your butt, right? Cool. Well, you have it from here. And then your imagination, you can make all kinds of exercises yourself. Cool. Yeah. Uh, any other questions you guys have? So when you're playing over, over changes, like you're doing mm -hmm. the acapella thing like you just did, are yeah. you actually thinking through all the changes of the tune? Or are you thinking more towards... Um, a total center at a certain place and hitting that along the way. Definitely. It's uh at at certain points I find myself thinking chord to chord. Um but the goal definitely is to have uh thinking about melody, thinking about a line and how it's gonna uh basically thinking about the start and where I'm gonna end. Mm -hmm. Um so I want to have that overarching uh idea over the changes. Like I see the changes as hurdles. You know, when the track runner has all these hurdles in front of him, each one of those changes, you know, it's, it's a stack of notes, right? <laughs> You're like, wow, uh, G minor seven. Oh my God, look at that stack. Then right after that, you have 
C7. Oh my God, I have to get over that. But then I get back to home, to F major, you know. Um, so, you know, a track runner who's limited is going to just jump over, jump over G minor 7, might get tripped up because they're thinking so much about the G minor 7, <laughs> right? <laughs> then they finally get to the G C7. By the time they get there, they're already tired because they, you know, probably injured, messed up their leg on the hurdle. And then to get to the C7, like, oh, I got to deal with this. Uh, get over to C7. And then when you get to F major, you know, the crowd is like, you, you all right? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you're having a hard time there. <laughs> but like the, the master track uh, runner is thinking, um, okay, I got, I got this distance between my, my start and my goal. And I want to keep a very, very consistent pace between those hurdles. And when I make the, um, the leap over each hurdle, I want the leap to be as smooth as possible so that I can, you know, when, by the time they're leaping, they're thinking about how they're going to land on the ground so that it's as smooth as possible. See, that sounds like a track runner I want to see, right? <laughs> I don't want to see a track runner who goes up to the hurdle and he's like... Ah. No, you don't want to see that. <laughs> <Somebody> like, <laughs> just goes over. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very important to... Um, uh, when learning how to play changes, you know, yeah, you learn your scales, you learn... Um, you know, what scales go with each chord, you know, that's important. It's, it's important to learn it on piano. I think piano is a very good uh, teacher of, uh, of harmony. Uh, and it's very good for improvisers to know uh, how that looks on the piano. Wow, this is how it sounds. And it's also good to know all your options. Okay, so I'm going to give an example. It's the same change. It's like G minor 7 to C7 to F major, all right? That's a very basic one. It's all diatonic. I'm going to play it again. I wish I had something to play behind me so you can hear the rub. But... studying changes, there's many different ways to approach the dominant chord. The dominant chord is the fifth scale degree of any given key, like uh, that's the fifth, right? That's the tension. Like you heard the tension and then it resolved back to the key. So it's a very, very important chord in that progression. All right, so I was just arpeggiating each of those chords. So now, now I'm trying to make some melodies with that. You know, there's so many different ways you can approach that same, uh, that same passage, and it's all based on knowing all the options that you have with the dominant chord. The dominant chord is the tension. Five is the tension, and one is the release. You know, that's simple. Um, uh, I wish I had a piano. Is there a piano in here? No, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. But I, I, it's like the more detailed I get into it, I think the more confusing I'll be. So I'll just leave it at that. You know, it's, it's important to learn uh, all the different things that you can do um, 
with each chord. You know, it's like, okay, I'm in G minor. <laughs> So it's like there's all these different um, tones that are outside of the key that you can use as what they call approach tones, you know? So, you know, okay, I'm going to, I'm trying to make a, a one smooth stream of consciousness here because right now I'm just going berserk. Okay, you got people like Charlie Parker and Diz, right? What they did was they started using notes outside of the key in order to even out the number of beats that they're playing in each bar. It's because you've got seven notes in each diatonic scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> they added one note to make it even, make it into eight. Now it's even, so they can play over 4-4 four, four, and not have to worry about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And the note that they found on the dominant chord, C7, is I'm just going to play the, the seven notes of the scale. They added the note at the end. Okay. Oh. Yeah, there we go. So it's a different, you know, there's a different note that they chose on each scale to make it even and fit over the bars evenly. And that's where the bop, be, bebop language came from. I think bebop is probably like mo one of the most sophisticated languages out there. I think. Anybody who wants to learn how to improvise on a high level should get into to bebop. I don't think there's any way around it. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, they really took the time and studied harmony. Uh, both Charlie Parker and this, they studied harmony from Europe. They studied harmony from the blues. They studied harmony uh, from uh, a very melodic sense from melodies. They would take melodies and and just mess with them and, and put different approach tones on them and stuff like that. So they've done all the work for us, right? All we have to do is check it out. It's all there on the records, you know? Uh, so check out their records, check out some, uh, some bebop players like Charlie Parker and Diz, also Sonny Stitt, an incredible bebop player. Um, Clifford Brown. Clifford Brown is very, very, very important. <laughs> he only, I mean, I think he only lived to be 25 years old, but yet has an incredible amount of records and an incredible amount of uh, trumpet and just jazz lingo that he created himself within just 25 years of his life. Pretty amazing. <laughs> what was the approach tone that you used on the minor scale? Was it the flat nine? Oh, it was uh, on that one. It was a, uh, it was just a major, major seven. Oh, okay. And then I did the same thing on the uh, the dominant. And then on the uh, on the major, on the F major, I did a flat thirteen. So you have to find another part where there's a where there's a whole step. Okay. So yeah, you know they're very clever, man. Bird and Diz, they figured out a lot of stuff for us. 
and it's all there, you know? <laughs> you know, if the more you check it out, all you have to do, you know what? If you shed, if you practice bebop melodies, like for a straight week, <laughs> I, I would love to see what you say to me after a week of practicing, like, say, like, Moves the Mooch. <laughs> like an incredible bebop hit. Um, also, uh, Donna Lee, you know. bass clarinet <laughs> at lightning speed and now I have to learn how to do that. <laughs> Can't let them get up the ups on me. So now I'm not using saxophone anymore. <laughs> but yeah. It's um it's an incredible uh, melodic statement and at the same time it's it's diving into these um, these chord changes and utilizing all these color tones that you can find within the chord. You know, and it's all in the key of A flat. And it's just like a masterpiece, and that's just one bebop hit. Imagine, you, imagine if you learn like five bebop hits within the week. You would know a lot of language right there. It's, that's a lot of notes right there. <laughs> you know, it's incredible. Um, another good melody to learn. This one taught me a lot about. Uh, it told me a lot of. It taught me a lot about swing versus bebop. Like in the swing era, I feel a lot of players were using rhythm. They were using very, very um, clever rhythmic phrases to even out the bar. So um, the beginning of this this certain uh, head. It's called Cochise. Um, it's named after some uh, Indian chief, some um, Native American chief. Uh, and it's based on Cherokee. <laughs> it's on, based on the changes of Cherokee. So the, the very first phrase. <laughs> you know, that's how they evened out the bar. They would take, they would take uh, an un uneven amount of notes and repeat them until it resolved. Now it's even. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, yeah. Yeah, that's that's where that's where it stops and then they kind of almost repeated again, but it resolves back on the beat. It's like, it's, a lot of it is very diatonic, but they have very there's a very, very limited amount of non-diatonic notes used within the melody. So it really shows you uh, kind of like a connection between the swing era and the bebop era. You know? So learn that melody, Cochise. It's written by Alvin Batiste. Alvin Batiste. But um, uh, I guess at the end of the class I can collect emails and then I can like send you all this stuff. I don't expect <laughs> you to like memorize it. Nobody has anything to write with. <laughs> but you know, you know, there's so many uh, great things that I've learned just plainly from curiosity. I think that's the that's one thing that you should really, really uh, encourage in yourself and others. Is to just be curious, you know. If you if you hear anything that you think is cool, figure it out, you know. 
it's like, wow, what is Charlie Parker playing right there? Let me just isolate those, those two bars. Let me see what he's playing and figure it out. And then play it in several different keys. Then go to the next phrase, do the same thing. You know, that's how you figure it out. There's no, there's no shortcuts around it. <laughs> you know? So, um, uh, does it, are there any other questions? I, and how, how long do we have? Uh, we have a while. We have a while? Yeah, okay. you just keep Can you just kind of give us a little bit of your history, your background, where oh, you started sure. from, you know, who you took lessons from, Definitely. you progressed, things like that? Definitely. Um, so I'm from Miami, Florida. I was born in Gainesville, Florida. Um, I shouldn't say I, I should say we, because I have a twin brother. We were born uh, in 1979 in Gainesville. Moved to Miami when we were three. And uh, yeah, we grew up around a lot of different, a lot of different cultures mixed together, you know? Haitian people, Cuban people, American people, black, white, all that stuff. Everything was there, Every the whole palette. And we heard all kinds of music all the time. And our dad, uh, he, was al he always had music playing in the house. And uh, I found it uh, very similar to a lot of my friends' stories, is that they always had music playing in the house. Their family had a culture of playing music all the time. And that's what, that's what it takes to be a, a great musician. You have to listen to music. And, I can enjoy it, <laughs> and, you know, you can't, you can't be like, I wish I was a musician, but I don't know any saxophones. <laughs> like, that's not going to really help. You got to learn who they are, and how it sounds, and, and, you know, why do you like it, you know? You have to listen to it over and over again. So um, I always have headphones on. I'm always listening to music. By the time I was 11, um, uh, I chose my ec extracurricular activity, um, that being instrumental music. I was too shy to be an actor. <laughs> I couldn't sing, <laughs> but I liked music, so I chose instrumental music. My brother did too, for the same exact reasons. And, uh, you know, the band teacher was taking out all the instruments, the, the trumpet, trombone, tuba, but when he got to the saxophone, Instant love. I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I fell in love right away. And my my band instructor was like, "Don't you want to learn the clarinet?" It haunts me to this day. He's like, Don't you want to learn the clarinet first? And I was like, "Nah, I want to play saxophone. Give me that." <laughs> and uh, I wish I took the clarinet first because the clarinet makes the saxophone seem like a toy in terms of technique. But I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm backtracking. I'm learning clarinet now. <laughs> That's a hard switch. A much easier switch from clarinet to saxophone. But anyway, I was 11. I started playing the instrument. I was, in, I was uh, very interested in many different kinds of music because my dad was always playing different kinds of music. He had Sly Stone playing, then he would have Coltrane playing, then he would have Freddie Hubbard playing, and then he would have uh, Smokey Robinson playing. Then Stevie Wonder, I definitely knew. I definitely knew the the uh, the record uh, "Talking Book," yeah, "Talking Book" by Stevie Wonder. I knew that. By the, you know, I knew that so well because my dad would play it all the time, over and over and over and over again. Um, so you know, I was my band teacher. Uh, his name was Mr. Kirkland, Steve Kirkland. Um, and he saw that I was interested in many different kinds of music. I would try to, try to make something up, try to play. And my brother, he chose the drums, so we would play together and try to play some stuff. He saw us struggling and he was like, hey, uh, check out this tape. It was Charlie Parker. Now's the time. And that was the beginning. <laughs> that was the very beginning. I think I was 12 at that time. And I was just trying to play that very first passage. <laughs> but, I got those two notes. <laughs> and, then, and then I saw that there was another note, but it kind of had something else in it. But I was like, 
Sudden sounded like what he was doing. <laughs> but I added that one half step between those two two notes. You know, that's the genius of their language. Just one little note makes a, an incredible melodic statement. So instead of playing, it swings better, you know? That one little note. just to get that head down, you know? But like, after I got it down, you couldn't stop me from playing it, man. <laughs> like, always playing it. And, you know, I fell in love with music, with, fell in love with the, the work aspect and also the reward aspect. Because, you know, when the parents started going wild at the, uh, at the, <laughs> at the uh, recitals of the band, you know, like, I'll take my solo, be all nervous, but play it, and it, you know, people started replying. I was like, wow, this is, it feels like, it feels very powerful, you know? <laughs> it's like something, it, it's almost like I didn't, I felt like it wasn't me. It was like an out of body of experience, you know? I really fell in love with it. And I think by the time I got to high school, my mom understood that both me and my brother were serious about this. We gave up football, we gave up track. We, we were even um, designing cars and stuff, you know, drawing cars. We wanted to be uh, car designers and engineers too. We wanted to do that too. But music just took over. It just took over. And by the time we got to high school, my mom, she enrolled us into uh, an art school called New World School of the Arts in downtown Miami. And there we met other people like us that were in love with music. And I think that's a very, very important part to, to surround yourself with people who, who love it just as much as you. And you, you start to get different techniques of like, what? Wait, what are you playing there, man? How did you do that? Oh, okay. Well, let me try. Man, I suck at it, but you sound good at it. <laughs> let me go back home. Then <laughs> you come back and they say, ah, I got you, man. I got you. You know? And then we did that through high school, went to the new school in 97. Both me and my brother went, went to the new school in, uh, in New York. And there I met incredible uh, students like uh, Robert Glasper, Bilal, Casey Benjamin, Kenya, Kenyatta Beasley. These were my classmates. Otis Brown. Uh, there's some... There were some students that came from Miami, you know, they were like, we wanted some of that too. Uh, Mike Rodriguez, Robert Rodriguez, um, incredible musicians. I was surrounded by all of them. Georgia Ann Muldrow came into, I think, two years after me. Jamiah Williams, who has this group called Aramage. Um, they're doing great. Um, yeah, I met all these guys in school. <laughs> we all just loved music and, you know, we were in love with it, you know. I heard about Robert in North Texas, you know, from North Texas. Um, they're like, yo, man, you got Rob Glasper. And Robert was hearing about me, like, man, I heard about this guy, Marcus Strickland. Now you, here you are with that white saxophone that I heard about. I had an LA sax at the time. <laughs> oh my God, piece of crap. <laughs> Crappiest horn ever. You got on camera good. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me zoom in for that one. <laughs> Good infamous marshmallow sax. But I, I had to play Peep, Michael Brecker. <laughs> had to play arrangement of that in high school. You know, we were at IJE. Robert's right there. You know, the whole North Texas band is there. They're like, <laughs> we heard you going to play Peep. <laughs> <laughs> and we played Peep. And, you know, that started the friendship. We jammed afterwards. And like, man, we love music. Man, where are you going to go after, after high school? And 
We were like, yeah, we're going to New York. We met in New York, played all the time, he was in my first band. Um, and now he has me playing in, in his band, this band that he just put together called Our Point of View. Um, it's got Robert Glasper, Ambrose Akimusiri, uh, Derek Hodge, myself, Leonel Lueke, Kendrick Scott. I think that's it. I think I got everybody. <laughs> it's like a quintet, and you know, we just we just recorded a record, and uh, I'm I'm very proud to be a part of this record because every single person on there um, is my hero. You know, Robert's my hero. Lionel's my hero. Nobody plays the guitar like Lionel. Nobody sings like him. Like when he plays the guitar, it almost looks like he's making a new guitar. <laughs> like something new is about to emerge. Because he's always doing this stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? It's like I'm muting the notes. That's why he sounds different than other guitars. He's playing different velocities on the guitar. It becomes a percussion instrument, you know. And um, Derek Hodge, he has perfect pitch. He, you know, we're in the studio. He's just recording this bass choir, like right there live, and I'm hearing this melodic line over what I just did. So I'm gonna go again and record that over what I just, you know, just arranging it right then and there. An incredible pro producer, um, yeah, he's an incredible musician. Robert, he's just, yeah, fantastic. Like he's a trendsetter, you know? He was like, uh, I'm gonna make the world fall in love with Dilla because I'm in love with Dilla, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that's ba basically what happened. And, um, uh, yeah, uh, Kendrick Scott, one of the most um, orchestral drummers I've ever met. Like, he knows how to shape a song, you know, like he'll, um, yeah, he'll, he'll make the song go into many different realms, you know, many valleys and peaks. Um, because he understands that it's, you know, it's a percussion instrument. It's all about velocity, you know, the force which you hit with something, that makes the note. We press down something and it creates a frequency. They create frequ different frequencies with different velocities, you know. You get a different note with, with different velocities. So, you know, he understands that a lot. Um, Ambrose, I mean, this guy... Talk about displacing, you know, when we're dis displacing the triad, playing the third on the top, like he does that all the time. Like all of his melodic phrases are like that. He's playing, like he'll play low register, then continue what he's doing up up high in another register. And you're like, wait, where did that come from? This <laughs> sounds like he's in two different worlds at the same time. Great, and great guy to know, very important guy. He's going to be very important. Um, and one of the most, one of the most incredible parts of this whole recording session, the last day we were supposed to just hang out while Herbie and, and Wayne Shorter did an interview. They were just going to do an interview for Blue Note because they were doing a, some kind of, um, I think they're doing some kind of documentary and they're, you know, interviewing them for it. So they came in the studio. But the thing is, I'm getting my medicine, you know. I'm separated from everybody else. I'm getting my medicine. I was sick. And I come to the studio and I see Wayne Shorter, Ambrose sitting next to each other in the place for me. And a chart of Mascalero, <laughs> one of my favorite Wayne Shorter tunes. And Herbie is over there on the piano. Rob's on the, the, the Fender Rhodes. Derek Hodge, Kendrick, Leonel, they're all waiting for like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and we did two, two takes of Mascalero, and that's on the record, you know? And it's just like, it was one of the most magical feelings I've ever had. So like, you know, I, I'm just including all this to, to tell you, it's like, it's a journey, you know? It's like this instrument, what you do with it, um, how many people it touches, like it's, it's all part of a big journey. You know, you never know. I had no idea when I was, the first two weeks I was playing the alto saxophone, I couldn't get one note up. I didn't know how much resistance I needed to get the, the reed to vibrate. I might have had a too hard of a setup too, 
But for the first two weeks of playing the alto saxophone, I didn't get one note out. But now, I'm doing stuff like this, you know? It's just incredible. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that's a, a, very, a very good thing to, to concentrate on is that, you know, it's all a journey. If you can't do something at first, just see it as this is the beginning of this journey. <laughs> Let's see what happens tomorrow. <laughs> you know. And along those lines, um, you had mentioned that you'd wanted to talk about uh, your personal brand, especially oh, yes, for definitely. for guys that are trying to get out there. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I uh, I think it's very important for for us all to as as artists to to recognize that we're all special, you know? Um, that's what they say is, that is wrong with my generation. Generation, what are we, the millennials? <coughs> I can't remember what generation I have. <laughs> 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 it doesn't make a difference, not at all. But they say my generation, that's what the problem with us. We, we feel that we're all special, but I don't think that's a problem. I think it's a, I think it's a great, it's a great feeling to have. It'll um, catapult you into many directions. Um, you know, one of the things that I had to understand about my playing is, even though this saxophonist over here can do ten thousand things that I cannot do, I can do ten thousand things he can't do. You know, and that's the thing that that is really going to set you apart is when you develop you develop your own voice. You know, you develop your own way to approach the saxophone. You know, when I play the alto, I have a strange sound on the alto, but I've embraced it. I'm like, I like my strange sound on alto. <laughs> so, you know, it's all over my latest record. And, you know, I can't wait to present it to the world. Like, hey, this is my interpretation of the alto saxophone. Hope you like it. If you don't, you suck. <laughs> no, but I, I think it's a, it's a very, um, it's a very important thing for for art, all artists to understand is that, um, you know, you you have your own journey. You know, embrace that, and you know, embrace the fact that you know, you learn different things than this person next to you. You know. Uh, they they know some things that you don't know, and you don't, and you know some things they don't know, and that's okay. <laughs> and also be curious, like, hey, that thing that you know that I don't know, what is that? <laughs> Learn that, and then come up with your own way to approach it. You know, it's a it's a very very important thing. Uh, it also makes you. It also creates demand. You know. Like, now I'm working with a lot of producers, and the producers, they have a sound, certain sound in their head, you know? Like, um, a friend of mine named Keon Harrell, he was, he's producing this track. Um, it's gonna be for this rapper, that this new rapper that's on uh, G-Unit Records. And um, he was hearing the soprano saxophone. And I have a very distinct soprano sound from a lot of other soprano sax players. So for that reason, he was like, I want your sound on this track. So I played my sound on the track. And the rapper, he loves it. It's gonna be on his record. You know? You have to embrace your sound. You have to, um, it's, like, it's like learning, learning the fundamentals is a great thing. But at the same time, nobody's gonna learn it the way you do, that you learn it. You know, just back to those exercises, right? You know, it's like you take that exercise, you're like, hmm. You know, like that same, The reason I, the reason I was pointed to that book is because of an alto saxophonist by the name of Logan Richardson. I don't know if you know him, but he's a bad dude, man. He just got signed to Blue Note too. Logan Richardson. He was in the back playing. He's like. I'm playing that, and what that is, is, but he's approaching it the opposite direction 
on alternating legs. I'll just demonstrate. Instead of playing, you go. You see? So one going up, one going down. sound the same. We're practicing the same thing, but we sound different. Curious, <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, would you mind talking a little bit about what we were talking about yesterday about how your new album, you know, it's 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 kind of breaking away from certain boundaries. Oh uh, yeah. In 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 that it, you just got to be comfortable with. Definitely. Doing, yeah. Doing that. It's uh okay. All right. My my latest record. It's called Nihil Novi. Uh, that's a Latin term for nothing new. And the uh, reason I chose that title is because I think that's a very powerful, um, very powerful sentence. Um, King Solomon said, Nihil novi sub soli, which means nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. There's a certain leaf when it falls. It twirls around like that. And the helicopter, you reverse whatever scientific thing is happening there, and it goes up. That's how a helicopter works. Nature. <laughs> Nature already created that. <laughs> you know? Planes, they have wings. Birds, they have wings. Nothing new under the sun. I think it's a very, very, very um, deep saying. But anyway, um, the reason I named the record that is because um, my answer to nothing new under the sun is, but there can only be one of you. You know, there's nobody like you on this planet. There's no, there's not one fingerprint that matches your fingerprint. There's not one soul that is like your soul, right? Our eyes, none of our eyes are the same, you know? So it's like, yeah, there's nothing new under the sun, but it's me. <laughs> That's who I am. So, you know, it's kind of like the psychology that was going on to, to just break away from what I was doing prior. What I was doing prior, I was like, man, I got I to gotta be as good as, as Bradford. I got to be as good as Coltrane. What will ever come of me if, if I can't, you know, imagine the pressure of that. I will never sound like coaching. I will never sound like Brantford. I will never uh, do the exact same things that they do because there's only one of them, you know? So I just started thinking of who I am. Me, I'm a guy who likes beats. I like making beats. And I happen to play saxophone too, you know? And at that time I had seven, over 700 beats in my library uh, for reason. Reason is a program that I use to make beats. I had 700 beats, I numbered them. It wasn't until like 590 that the beats started sounding kind of good. <laughs> and rappers and singers started saying, hey, I like that. Can I sing over that? Can I, can I sing over that? You know, so uh, a lot of the music that's on my latest record, it came out of that, uh, out of the beats. You know, I'll try to develop the beats and, and make a song out of it. Uh, you know, to, to create something refreshing, something cool, something that I, I think is kind of neat. And uh, uh, I started assembling a band that, that could pull this off. I needed a drummer who's good at pocket playing. So Charles Haynes, an incredible drummer who plays with uh, Michelle and Digo Cello and Marcus Miller and all kinds of incredible musicians. I was like, man, if you could if you could play this music, that would be great. He was like, yeah, I'm down, man. Cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we were working together on some demos, and he brought in the bass player from Boston. Um, he was playing a, on a song that of mine called TikTok. It's a, it sounds like a clock, <laughs> and it's actually like kind of like the, uh, the title track 
almost like a title track of the record. And he was playing the bass line that I wrote, but made it sound like a thousand times better. <laughs> Just the, the inflections, all the, the way that he touches, like the touch on the strings, that makes your sound, you know? Very distinct sound. It almost sounds like the Jay Dilla beats when, you know, Jay Dilla would make bass notes by rubbing a record. And you take that and he would tune it to a bass note. And you take different notes, tune them, and he'll make a bass line out of it. That's how he got like a very signature kind of sound out of the bass, you know, bass frequencies. <laughs> Okay, this guy can do that on electric bass. <laughs> Make the electric bass sound like that. So he was playing that stuff on my song. I was like, you're my bass player. <laughs> I woke up, like I was, I was exhausted. I woke up and he was recording it. I was like, what? What's going on? I went in there. I was like, you're my bass player. <laughs> okay. <laughs> His name is Kyle Miles. And uh, there was a long time ago, there was this performance. I thought an orchestra was playing, but it was only a keyboardist and a drummer. <laughs> that keyboardist was Yuki, big Yuki Hirano. He's now my keyboardist. <laughs> He's one of my keyboard players. Another person I met at Charles Haynes studio was Mitch Henry. He plays he now plays organ in my in my group. I really love the way that he approaches the instrument. It's not an easy, easy instrument to play. You can't just play piano and then jump on the organ. Expect, no. <laughs> it's like, it, it responds differently. There's air going through it. It's not as percussive. Plus, there's all these other knobs and stuff you got to mess with in order to make the vibrato different in different registers and stuff like that. It's a whole different instrument. So he plays the, the hell out of the organ and the keyboard. He is not in my group. He's in, he's in my group now. And uh, Keon Harrell is a trumpet player that I met while in the new school. He went to new school. And I was like, where are you from, bro? He's like, St. Louis. I'm like, dude, you sound like it, man. You sound incredible. It's just very soulful sound. Every time he touches his trumpet, I feel like he's pouring his heart out, man. I'm like, man, you must have seen hard times or something. I don't know. <laughs> he's the trumpet player in my group. And um, uh, we did a performance think 2013, and uh, Michelle and Diego Cello came to the performance to check it out. And I think she was in, digging it. And I was like, wow. And, you know, Charles was saying, yeah, Michelle dug it, man. She was liking it. Like, man, you think she would mind producing my record? And he was like, no, nah, man. I think it would be cool. And he, he found the right time to ask her, and she, he asked her, and she was like, yeah, cool. Let's do it. And now I have this record. It's, it's produced by Michelle, who's an incredible genius. She's born on the same day as Charlie Parker and Michael Jackson, August 29th. Something about that day. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, she produced my record, uh, did a great job, brought in Bob Powers, who actually mixes and masters like most of the hip-hop stuff that I was listening to to make the beats. <laughs> you know, like Jay Dilla and Slum Billy and Q-Tip and all those cats, they worked with Bob Power. You know, incredible genius of a sound engineer. And we made this record and it's just, this is going to be my debut record on Blank, on Blue Note. You know, it's, it couldn't, I couldn't have planned it better than it just happened. You know, it just happened that way, you know. And I think it all happened, if there was anything that was, that was uh, propelling it, I think it was just pure curiosity. I was like, man, how does Dilla get his beats to sound that way, man? Let me try to do that. And I realized I sucked at it. <laughs> <laughs> I kept on doing it over and over again. And finally, I started figuring things out. It's like, oh, okay. Tunes this first bass drum a little higher than the next one. The hi-hat is swinging, it's not going straight. The snare is swinging, everything is swinging. Everything swings. <laughs> and I, you know, I started putting beats together, I was like, okay, cool. So, yeah, there you go, curiosity. And realizing that you're not somebody else, you are you. <laughs> you know, I think it's a very, very important thing to, to embrace, you know.
it, it, it makes you stand out from the crowd. You know? At any given jam session, there's like 15 saxophonists. <laughs> and they all can play, man. They all can play. Especially in New York. Oh my God. New York City. Any, if you see a saxophonist, like, you can play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can play. It's a cesspool is what yeah. I mean. It's a cesspool of good musicians. Yeah. yeah, they're all there, and they're going to tear up giant steps just as bad, just as good as you. So you better sound different somehow, some way, <laughs> if you want to stick out, you know? So, uh, yeah, you know, that's basically my story, man. And thanks for allowing me to... To uh, to share it with you guys, and uh, if you if you have any other questions, I'll be glad to answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you.